Uh, my goal today is to share a few ideas about cross-sector leadership from being a cross-sector leader, but also studying cross-sector leaders. I'll share some mistakes I've made. Uh, and one of the best pieces of advice I got was not just learn from your own mistakes, but learn from others. Uh, every mistake that's ever been made has been made. So if we can do that, uh, that's a good start. Uh, I'd start with my own story a little bit. Um, I was born in Nova Scotia. Uh, my parents moved from and immigrated from southern India. And in Nova Scotia, small towns, 10,000 folks, a few hundred folks, I was often the only uh, South Indian person in town. Uh, and as a result, I often wished I had different hair. I often wished that my skin color was actually different. And I would pretend to be white, to be honest. Uh, and I found a way to do that. When I moved then to Ottawa, it was a much more multicultural city. Uh, and I started having a lot more folks and friends from southern Indian backgrounds. I was the only Christian in a group of Muslims and Hindus. Uh, and often I was the white kid in the brown town. Uh, and then when I moved to Toronto, then it was an even bigger city. I was a small town boy living in downtown Toronto. And crossing all these borders, it wired my brain in a certain way. I always found a way to fit in. I always found a way to uh, speak the language of the people that I was with. And as a result of those types of things, I started to not just embrace change or be okay with it, I started to love it. I started to love change and crossing borders and what eventually was crossing sectors as well. Uh, when I was growing up, my parents also made a pretty dumb decision to put all of our financial savings into Nortel networks. Nortel, right? Our Canadian darling, our telecom gem. Well, everyone more or less knows what happened there. We lost all of our money, all of our savings. My dad became, to be honest, more and more depressed. My mom became more and more impatient. Stress came into our family, and our lifestyle had changed. Um, and in me, I didn't really understand what business was or the financial sector or Nortel, but I did start to kind of hate the business sector. I did start to hate banks. I told myself, I'll never work for a bank, but that's just not the way I was wired. Instead of running away from business, I actually ran towards it. I studied business in undergraduate, and one of my first jobs was with Morgan Stanley, one of the largest investment banks in the world. And I didn't go there to make money. Uh, I went there to learn. And I learned actually quite a bit, not just the skills, but I learned that finance and banks have a very positive role to play in society. They can fund businesses that hire people, pay wages, pay taxes. And the people in there weren't all so bad. Uh, they were there to learn skills, being a challenging environment, and um, they were there to provide for their families. And so it wasn't all so bad. There was a duality to all of it. I was also there when the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, and 2009 hit. And Morgan Stanley was one of those banks that almost crashed. Uh, along with the rest of the world. And it was happening all over again. Pensioners, workers, people losing their shirts. And there was nothing really that I could do about it. Or was there? And that's when I started to observe governments, central banks, the Department of Finance, coming in to save the system from falling off the cliff and every man, woman, and child with it. And in the process said, wow, policymakers have such an important role to play in financial system stability. I want to go work in Ottawa. And so I did. Moved to Ottawa, working in the Department of Finance Financial Stability Group. Our task was to uh, craft the domestic policy response and also the international policy response to financial system stability. And in the process, I thought, wow, what an opportunity for me to learn from policymakers. How do they think about the system, the economy? What an opportunity, I thought, for them to learn from a banker, someone who thought about deals and growth. And what an opportunity, I thought, for us to learn from each other, to design a more financially equitable, sustainable, and stable system. Well, that was a pretty naive uh, assumption for me. Uh, I'll tell you what, I made a lot of mistakes. I had no idea the culture that I was walking into. Not that it was bad, it was just different. And they had no way to really onboard someone like me. And I made a ton of mistakes. Overall, the motivations were different. The language was different, and there were no translators between the two sides. There were very few, except for two people who I held as role models, and it inspired what I'm doing today. Two people, uh, Mark Carney, who, after a career at Goldman Sachs uh, as a banker around the world, ended up becoming our governor and led a huge aspect of Canada's policy response, and now is leading it globally to the financial crisis and Ed Clark, someone who actually grew up and worked in the Department of Finance, was an assistant deputy minister there before he became the CEO of TD Bank and a very, very strong supporter of both uh, LGBT rights and financial literacy. And these two people there are what we call tri-sector athletes, able and experienced in business, 
government and the nonprofit sectors. They both have innovative leadership models, but they're able to collaborate across sectors, bring them together uh, in a way that produces really incredible results. And that brings me to the, my first good idea. We're all here for impact. And in the process, I want to take us back to grade 10 physics. Sorry for everyone who hated grade 10 physics in the room. The scientific definition of impact is mass times velocity. Mass times velocity equals impact. Now, governments have the mass, humongous mass. They have social programs, they can enact laws, they can change things. But they typically don't have a lot of velocity. Startups and nonprofits have the velocity. They can move very, very quickly, but they typically tend to be quite small. Now, if you can figure out how to get the mass of government, the mass of government, to move at the speed and the velocity of a startup, that is a vehicle for unbelievable impact. Now, impact is not just what we're here for, though. Impact it can be good, it can be bad. It's by definition neutral. What we're here for is positive social impact, positive environmental impact. And I have to break down that scientific equation a little bit more, because what's missing is direction. We need direction of where we're going. Now, velocity is actually a function of both direction and speed. And so the true equation is mass times, times speed times direction equals positive social impact. So how do we go about building on this equation? How do we manage the explosive reactions of all of these elements uh, to bring chemistry into the mix? Well, first you want to map out all the interests in your stakeholder system, all of the interests that, are, that can affect the issue, that are affected by the issue that you care about. Map them all out and then figure out where do they fit in that equation? Are they the mass? Are they the speed? Do they provide the direction? Now, there's an easy answer, which is government is mass, business is speed, nonprofits and academia provide direction. But that's a bit of an oversimplification. Governments, yes, provide the mass, but they have a lot of data, and that can provide direction. Also, if the political climate is right and the timing is right, governments can act at a speed that's very alarming, faster than any business or nonprofit can. When it comes to business, they can provide a lot of the speed, but they also provide mass. They have distribution networks nationally internationally that can deliver products and services around the world. They also have direction where they have millions of dollars spent in research and development that have often come up with socially and environmentally useful insights, but often, to be honest, sit on the shelf because it's not a profitable type of idea. And then nonprofits, yes, and academia provide direction, but they can provide mass through the thousands of volunteer hours that can get work done really quickly at a very low cost. And they can provide the mass through the lists and the relationships uh, of beneficiaries, and that can allow uh, quite a quick speed of execution as well. There's a case example of this, Procter & Gamble. They have something called the Children's uh, Safe Drinking Water Program. About a billion people don't have access to clean drinking water, and hundreds, thousands of children die uh, every day for this. The Tide research team, Tide is the detergent that I'm sure a lot of us use, they were doing research and they came up with this formula that can actually purify dirty water, deadly water in fact. But when you're washing clothes, you don't wash it with dirty water. So it wasn't really commercially applicable, so it sat on the shelf. Until they started chatting with the Center for Diseases Control and Prevention. And they saw that there was an opportunity in this formula. And together they developed something called Pure, which is a small little pack you can pour into 10 liters of water, and it immediately turns dirty and deadly water into safe drinking water. Think about the applications in disasters, in tsunamis, hurricanes, etc. And as a result, they distribute this on a nonprofit basis, and they partner with nonprofits like Save the Children, Care, and distribute it around the world. Now, there's a lot of resources at play, but no one uh, party had all of the resources. And so cross-sector partnerships, if you can master this equation of mass, velocity, and impact, uh, is a great way to scale resources and impact. A friend of mine, uh, his name is Daniel Holmesy. He's the director of neighborhood resilience at the city of San Francisco. His job is to prepare San Francisco, not just for the next earthquake, but for the next heat wave. Uh, and his model is being exported to cities around the world uh, who deal with other natural disasters, neighborhood resilience. And he said that if you can understand how to manage cross-sector partnerships, you can harness a thousand times of the capacity that are under your immediate control. So mass, velocity, impact. Mix these four. 
uh, mix these three elements and you get an explosive reaction. If you don't, your solution might be inert. How do you find the people then? So you've mapped this all out, but how do you find the people? There's another law, not too scientific, that I'll introduce you to called Joy's Law. Uh, a gentleman named Bill Joy was the founder of Sun Microsystems. And he said that no matter who you are, no matter where you work, the smartest people in the world do not work for you. The smartest people in the world work for someone else. And, you know, by definition, of course that's true. We've all worked with very, very smart people. I've worked with trailblazers at this nonprofit called Young Diplomats of Canada. Uh, I used to be at McKinsey, very sharp people. Uh, I've worked with folks at the White House, brilliant policymakers. And yet, no matter where I've worked, who I've worked with, we were just frankly always outnumbered by the planet Earth. So the sum of all these people have thought of the ideas that you've already thought of. Some of them have launched the ideas, maybe failed, they've learned a lot, and they would be excited to meet you. So how do you find these people? Just think of one, one innovative person in your network. Call them up, tell them your idea, and ask them for who are the two people that I should talk to. Then talk to those two people and ask them for two more people. Ask them for two more people and ask them for two more people. And very quickly, you'll, and make sure it's across sectors, of course, by the way. And then very quickly, what you'll see is 30 people who know about your idea across sectors that want to help you. So that's the first idea, mass, velocity, impact. The second idea is about appreciating the motives of the other sectors. Uh, the idea is money equals power equals mission. I used to be the executive director of an institution out in New York called the Intersector Project. It was a nonprofit research firm and we were studying cases of cross-sector collaboration and leadership, uh, exactly what we're talking about here today. And part of what our work was to work with the White House Office of Social Innovation to convene leaders across sectors to ask this question, how can we develop more cross-sector leaders? At one of these convenings of about 30 people, there was a pretty tense exchange between two people. One was uh, an executive at uh, a large financial data firm based out in New York. The other was the dean of a public university, one of their departments. And uh, in that exchange, the executive from Bloomberg talked about a career model, a, a life model that her dad had taught her. Learn, earn, return. Learn for the first 30 years of your life, then earn money for the next 30 years, and then in your last 30 years, return all that money back to society, give back. And so she was saying that, well, I'm at the end of my business career, and now it's time for me to return back to society. And the reaction of the dean from the public university, she, she was actually livid. She was livid. And she said, what makes you even think we want your money? It was very, very tense. And let's just say both parties were a little bit upset. They didn't talk the rest of the day. And the dean from the public university, she was livid because what makes you think that now it's your time to return after a year, a career of making money? Uh, what gives you the right to buy your way into the social sector? So months later, uh, I went to visit the executive from the financial firm in her office. And I brought up the incident and I asked, hey, um, you know, how did it go? What did you think? And I was expecting her to be an annoyed that judgment was passed on her for something she was just following from her dad's advice. And she said, no, Matt, I'm actually not annoyed. Later on, I learned that for the first time, how my approach to life and career could be viewed as offensive to someone who had dedicated their entire lives to social impact and doing good. And for that reason, um, it completely changed her mindset. Now, who was wrong in that mix? <laughs> It's not about who was wrong. It was more like, what was the opportunity that was lost to collaborate because they just simply couldn't appreciate each other's motivations. Have you ever felt like someone in that story? Have you ever seen this kind of a situation play out? We know we need to work together, mass times velocity, right? But until we can overcome our prejudices and biases in how the other sectors think, we're always gonna be getting in our own way. And so I wanted to offer three steps that can, you can use to arrest counterproductive behavior when it comes to the motivations and biases you have and others do uh, for different sectors. Uh, these ideas come from Verna Myers, a uh, diversity consultant. First, acknowledge your biases. What are the first few words that come to mind when you think about the business sector? The nonprofit sector. Academia. And government. 
if these words don't assume intrinsic value and strength, chances are you're othering the other sectors. And that can get in the way immediately of collaboration. You're more likely to run away than run to. Now, it's natural to have preconceived notions. It's how we live our lives. It's how we survive, to be honest. But when you notice that happening, instead of running away, run towards it. The second thing, then, is to engage and literally stare. Stare at awesome nonprofit leaders. Stare at awesome government leaders. Stare at awesome academics. Stare at awesome into public leaders. Seriously, find pictures of leaders across sectors that you admire. Put them up on your wall and stare at them. What ends up happening is we disassociate ourselves from the negative stereotypes that we had. And we begin to see the power and the, uh, the presence of who they can be and who they are. The third thing is call it out when you see it. Whenever you see someone degrading the other sectors, degrading the, uh, the power-hungry politician or the money-minded businessman or the kumbaya, uh, nonprofit. Whenever you see these types of stereotypes playing out, call it out. Call it out because not only do you need to set that tone for your management team, for your family, wherever it's happening, but there's new employees at the table too. There's new volunteers at the table too, and they're definitely taking your lead as these stereotypes perpetuate themselves or get dismantled. And so in the process of doing this, uh, research shows that if you simply know one person from another place, another culture, another sector, you have a friendship that me immediately is the first step to breaking down these biases. So examine your network. Expand your social and professional circles. Who's in it and who's not? And importantly, do you have authentic relationships with business leaders and bankers, with environmentalists and advocates, with policy wonks and politicos? That's the second good idea. The third good idea I wanted to share was being a trilingual. That's learning to speak the languages of the other sectors. So as you move across contexts, as you work with different people, it's important to know the rules of engagement in the new context. So let's take basketball and soccer, for example. They both have a ball about this size. They both play in stadiums. They both have fans. The objective is to take the ball and shoot it into a net. Well, imagine you're a soccer player and all of a sudden, someone passes you the ball and you kick it. That's a foul, right away. Imagine you're a soccer player, okay, you figured it out. You have to use your hands. You're dribbling down the court. And then the coach says, drive to the basket. Soccer player goes, what? What basket? If you don't figure that out, then you immediately lose the ball and it's a shot clock violation. And that's the same thing that happens when you bring together business, government, nonprofits, and academics. Lots of fouls and lots of violations. As part of that uh, convenings we held with the White House over the last couple of years, we ended up launching something called the Presidio Institute Cross-Sector Leadership Fellows. 24 people, mid-career, high potential, across sectors, coming together to learn how to collaborate across sectors. And on day one, we saw this turbulent language barrier play out on day one. There was a nonprofit leader who works with at-risk youth, um, urban folks, folks with difficult backgrounds, history of incarceration, um, single parents, uh, often drug issues, et cetera. And he was talking about when they work with their youth, they are very deliberate about using the term young adults and not kids. They call them young adults. Why? Because according to him, it empowers them to feel authority over their life, their future, it makes them feel older, more mature, and it gives them a sense of responsibility to be called an adult, not a kid. Even though, you know, by traditional age standards, you might call them kids. Then you saw all the nonprofit people more or less nodding their heads. Half the group was nonprofit. And then a business leader from a Fortune 500 company said, Oh, that's interesting. Uh, we actually do the exact opposite. We are hiring these top shot MBAs who come from really big schools. They have egos, they have expectations. And you know what we do? We actually force ourselves to call them kids. Why? To put them in their place, to make sure they know they're at the bottom to make sure that they know they have to earn their way up and they're not smarter than anyone else. We actually call them kids. And in the process of that exchange, and it went back and forth a few times, each person grew more and more frustrated with each other, more and more offended by what each other was saying. Trust eroded, opportunity lost. Now I asked myself, well, who, what is the right term? I mean, who, who was right and who was wrong? 
Is it, is it young adults or should it be kids? And again, I don't know if that's the right question. Uh, the right question is, what barriers were lost? What barriers um, did they hit in language that resulted in them not being able to understand what each other was trying to say? Now, these types of language differences come in many, many different forms. You can have the same word and different meaning. So, uh, equity, for example. Equity in the nonprofit sector typically means um, fair and just uh, services provided to all segments of society. Uh, typically, and especially those who are most vulnerable and underprivileged. Equity in the business sector means compl something completely different. What ownership stake do you have in the company? That's what equity means. Those two don't match. Margin is another example. In the nonprofit sector, we talk about designing for the margins. Who's left out of society? Who's left out of programs? Margin in the business sector means how much money do you have left over after you've paid all of your expenses? That's what margin means. It means profit. It's two words, same words, different meaning. Then you have different words, the same meaning. So logic models. Logic models go from left to right, typically. Uh, you know, inputs, activities, equals, outputs, and outcomes, and impact. Well, for, for a nonprofit person, that makes a lot of a sense. If you just turn it on its head, it actually starts to look like a strategic plan that a business person would use, to right from the top, right to the bottom. Different words, same meaning. There's one other class, which is where I think a lot of the fun can come, a lot of the innovation can come. It's when you have different words. It's when you have concepts in one sector that don't even exist in the other sector. So take diplomacy, for example. Diplomacy is a word we use in government. Uh, but with globalization, with state-owned economies around the world, there's a new term in business world called corporate diplomacy. Another term would be the bottom billion used in international development contexts. Uh, that term is actually being transferred to business as well. As businesses expand into segments of markets that are hard to reach and previously deemed unprofitable, the term they use is now the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. Another term is return on investment. That's a business term, right? But that's actually being manifested in the nonprofit sector quite a bit. It's launching entirely new industries of finance, impact investing, the nascent social impact bond field. And we have this term now called social return on investment. And these concepts that never really applied or existed in other sectors are all of a sudden being transferred. Now, languages, language differences go beyond just the terms, though. It's also about how we define problems and solutions. Let's take uh, aging transportation infrastructure, for example. We can all agree that the result of that is increased congestion, higher costs, decreased mobility, and reduced safety. Uh, most sectors can agree on those things. But each sector looks at it very differently. They define the problem that they feel very differently. For governments, it's about lower GDP and output, and as a result, lower tax revenue and an unhappy electorate. We all saw how much transportation mattered uh, in the election last year here in Toronto. For nonprofits, we talk about inequitable access to both services, opportunity, and employment, and rising greenhouse gases, the divided city. And in business, we talk about lower productivity, higher supply chain costs, lower customer satisfaction, because it takes longer to simply get out of Toronto. These are all three very legitimate ways at looking at the issue of aging transportation. As Ronald Heifetz, a professor at Harvard Kennedy School, says, it's important as a cross-sector leader to get out on the balcony so you can see the entire system of issues and how each sector defines them. And if you're able to bring all of these different issues to bear in a cross-sector partnership, all the language, create a common fact base in terms that everyone understands, then you're well on your way. And as a leader, if you can speak all three languages, you'll immediately skyrocket in terms of credibility and your ability to influence without authority. You'll be seen as someone who gets it. So that brings me to the fourth idea, which is go broad. How do you go about becoming a trilingual? How do you go about meeting people across sectors? Go broad. This is a very exciting idea for me because it's um, now part of the research we're doing at Prospect Madison. Uh, we're writing a book on it right now, and the basic premise uh, is captured by a British poet and explorer named Robert Twigger. He says, our age reveres the specialist, but humans are natural polymaths at our best when we turn our minds to many things. As consumers and citizens, we like to place ourselves in the hands of 
technical experts. We want to know that our, our pilot has flown 10,000 hours, tens of thousands of hours, in fact. We want to know that our surgeons have performed hundreds of similar operations. And that makes sense when it comes to inherently specialist activities like being a pilot or uh, doing operations. But our obsession with depth has gone well beyond that. It's now the central premise for how we organize education and work. In education, very, very early on, we're taught what do you want to be? What career do you want to have? Different tools say this is the career you're going to have, as if that's what you're going to do for 50, different, for 50 years. And people have to choose very early on. I go to the York University website. I went to York uh, here in Toronto. And back in the day, there were, you know, on the undergraduate list, 20 some degrees you could choose from. Now it's 70. And it's not like we have 70 new fac 50 new faculties. There's now 70 specialist degrees that as a 18 year old, you have to choose from. 17 year old, you have to choose from. At work as well, we are incentivized to go deeper and deeper and deeper to become more and more specialist in what we're doing. And it's hard to avoid that. And as a result, we tend to pretend to be specialists sometimes. And we tend to narrow our own stories to be able to say, I have a coherent story. I go on LinkedIn and two colleagues of mine, one is a, uh, the president of a very, very large nonprofit um, foundation and uh, program service in the United States. Her entire background was in Wall Street, but her bios don't say that. Her LinkedIn doesn't say that. She's erased her Wall Street uh, career path from her entire bio. I look at a colleague who's in the business sector now. He's starting a new business in the finance sector as well. He actually got his career started at Oxfam, and he's worked uh, in Ottawa on the political staff. Nowhere to be found, not on his LinkedIn bio, not in any of his bios. And so we tune ourselves to be more and more specialist. And so in this century, our route to success and happiness is deep specialization. But studies actually show that broad people, people who have a collective interest, actually are able to make better predictions about the future. They're able to weed through the fog of complexity. They draw from an eclectic array of traditions. They accept ambiguity. And they don't have formulaic solutions to ill-defined problems. Now, it's important not to just go broad across sectors. You can live in different cultures. You can study different disciplines. You can master different functions. They all wire your brain to pick up one of the most important skills of all, learning agility. So there's a few strategies to go broad. First, going broad includes elements of breadth and degrees of depth. We all live on a spectrum of extreme breadth and extreme depth. And the important thing is to pick where do we want to be on that spectrum. It's not jack of all trades, master of none. It's not the deep one trick pony. I would say it's jack of all trades, master of some. So you pick two or three or four areas that you can be really, really good at. Find your sweet spot. The second is we think this is about big choices, changing careers, moving countries, moving sectors. But there's a lot of small choices we can make every day, month, uh, and week. And the accumulation of all of that will be a different road to going broad. Three steps, read and learn. Read sections of the newspaper that you typically don't read. Network and chat with others, enjoying the next event for that particular community. And engage, study, volunteer, and put yourself in the shoes of others, even if it's just for an evening, a weekend, or a week. I return to Robert Twigger, who says, human nature and human progress are polymathic at its root. And life itself is various. We need many skills to be able to live it. Humans are naturally broad. Think about all the things you did this morning and how many skills it took. It's a natural thing for us to do. And so really, just be authentic as you go broad. After all, the edges of authenticity are broad. That brings me to my final idea, higher broad. And I know it's not the same five ideas on the list. I think I was hungry when I was writing that fourth idea. <laughs> um, higher broad. The call to action doesn't end with individuals alone. Institutions have a role to play. You folks are all decision makers. You folks are all can, in a position to hire. And so in your work, remember Joy's law, that the smartest people work for someone else. But that doesn't mean they can't work for you. Adjust your job postings. Instead of demanding significant expertise and decades of experience in a particular area, adjust those needs and requirements to be open to other non-traditional places. And then post not at the regular spots, but through different networks and to different schools. The worst case outcome is you have more options to choose from. And you might just find the diamond in the rough. And finally, in hiring broad people, there is a risk. You will lose them. By definition, they're going to be interested in something else at some point, and they're going to leave. It might be in one, it might be in two, it might be in three years. 
accept that, embrace that. Because as a result, you'll develop a reputation for where really smart and exceptional people go. And your alumni will give back in ways that others don't. So I'll close now. I began with my upbringing and experiences, the scars and the clashes that happened. And I learned a lot, and there's no reason others have to make the same mistakes. That's why I'm here. You can save yourself trouble when working across sectors if you follow some of these ideas. One, to achieve impact, combine mass, speed, and direction, all three. To build trust, accept other people's motivations, run towards them, not away. To work like a team, speak all three languages, and transfer new ideas. To develop yourself, go broad, make big and small choices, and be authentic when you do it. And then finally, to develop others, encourage breath in your own organization. In the long run, it'll be a win. I really hope you enjoyed these ideas. And if not, we can uh, rename this five bad ideas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>